first session of the uh, marine vegetation and we are we are supposed to have two unfortunately yes sir didn't make it uh, to come in time so i call ramla to present her uh, poster for three minutes thank you So, thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I'm Ramla Bohlel. I'm a master's degree student and a marine engineering student, too. So, I'm working on the, uh, the non indigenous species, Polyrpa cylindresia and the impact of these species on our native one, Simodosia nodosa, in the marine and coastal protected area, Korea Island. <coughs> so I'm presenting you now uh, a pilot study, uh, a pilot study uh, that uh, we did it in 2020, which is uh, by uh, my work of uh, baccalaureate degree, and uh, where we decided to choose two depths 0.62 and 1 uh, and 1.10, two and at each depth we have two sites. The, dif the, the difference between these two si two sites is the presence of color Basilandrasia. So uh, we studied environmental parameters, uh, organic matter, granulometry, uh, granulometric sediment uh, or, uh, composition, uh, biometry of Simodusia nodosa the density of Simodosia nodosa and also the taxonomic groups associated to it. Um, so uh, the results show uh, significant differences between the two sites. For example, we have a low concentration of chlorophyll A uh, in, uh, in the presence of cholerpa. We have also um, 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 a shorter leaf length of Simodosia nodosa and an important decrease of the density of, color, uh, of Simodosia nodosa in the presence of cholerpa. So uh, that uh, this probably uh, can be caused by a competitive relationship between the, these two species, maybe for uh, nutri nutrients or, uh, or space. So we are still monitoring and studying this, uh, this relationship. And uh, according to all this, we can conclude that uh, the Collier Pasilandresia has uh, an invasive behavior and can really uh, affect our local ecosystem uh, negatively. So uh, thank you for your attention. And for more information, you can check out my poster and I will provide you with an A4 forma poster. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So uh, you, you, you were on time. So uh, now we will go to the uh, round table and I call Christine. So thank you. Thank you.
Bonjour tout le monde. Good morning everybody. Uh, buongiorno. Uh, on a essayé ce matin donc de vous faire un petit bilan uh, de qu'est-ce qu'il existe aujourd'hui en matière de restauration verbier. Et euh, je vais essayer, je vais parler en anglais ensuite, euh, et euh, de, de vous faire un peu un point d'une étude qui a été faite pour euh, faire un bilan de qu'est-ce qui se fait en matière de protection, de conservation de l'herbier par rapport à une problématique qui était l'ancrage. Donc, je cède la parole tout de suite à Frédéric Villers de l'Office français pour la biodiversité. Can you hear me Hello, good morning. I'm Frederick Villers, working for the French Biodiversity Agency. Uh, I'm pleased to be here today to, yes, to, to present you the Mediterranean Posina Network. Um, it would be really brief, just to give you an, uh, what, an idea of what it is. Uh, basically, it's, it's a network uh, that has been created uh, less than three years ago. Initially, the topic was about uh, anchoring. In December 2019, the European Commission organized a biogeographical um, congress about uh, how to manage anchoring via Posidonia. It was the first time that so many people working about anchoring met. Uh, and well, after this meeting, people were like, well, let's carry on uh, working together. And that was how started the, the meeting and uh, the idea to basically work together to find collective solutions. Um, so initially, the idea was to protect Posidonia from anchoring, but little by little, speaking with uh, different international institutions, such as uh, the CARASP, IUCN, um, MedPan, WWF, we decided to even go further and try to bring all the countries together to protect Posidonia. So not only about anchoring, but about all the different pressures, such as the impact of coastal structures, uh, pollution, trolling, invasive species. Um, so here on the slide, yeah, just give you uh, the beginning, the, the reasons why uh, we worked on it, the impact of anchoring. And last year, we decided to, to have an ambitious objective, which was to, to try to basically protect Posidonia by 2030. Um, and this objective has been tackled during the One Ocean Summit last year in Brest. So basically, what is uh, the what the objective of the network? It's not just uh, to network. Um, so first, here you have the map with uh, different countries covered by Posidonia. So we try to to find countries, to find partners in each country. Uh, as you see, we have most of the country. We we still uh, lacking some countries, but now we are more than fifteen countries, more than fifty people. What's important is, again, it brings uh, scientists. Uh, the objective is really to be complementary to different networks. But scientists here, you basically are, uh, almost all the scientists um, are here today about Posidonia. But we also wanted to have managers from marine protected areas, decision makers, which is highly important, and private sectors. That means social professionals, because we strongly believe that if we're just together, we know what we know how important it is Poisonia, but we still have to bring people and especially decision makers and social professionals to, to go further. Just a quick summary of what we plan to do. Um, well, the idea is to tackle the, 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 all the different issues. Um, so one of the areas is, of course, to, to boost the knowledge and monitoring, but this thing is, is already uh, well, uh, well organized with, with, with the car. And the different institutions with many to, to support and to be complementary. Then one of the objectives is clearly, okay, once we got the study, but the study we have to protect Posidonia. It's quite urgent in terms of degradation. So we want to push action. So push action, that means in areas where we already have 
the idea of what to do. If we need to set up boards, set up economics, let's do it. There are some countries or some areas where it's not yet clear what to do in terms of measures. So we need more science to, to know what's the pressure, where, how is the state of Posidonia. Most of the time, we also need to push regulations. Christine will present you uh, the state of heart of legislation of Posidonia in different countries. Um, once we put the regulations, we protect it. And the last point is to raise awareness. It's incredible how Posidonia is not uh, so well known in the large audience. Everyone knows coral waves, but people forget that we also have Posidonia. Now, we try to explain to people that. Uh, for as a benchmark for action at the Mediterranean level. So the context, as uh, said by uh, my colleagues, it's uh, there is an increase of uh, boating at the regional level, uh, and particularly in the Adriatic Sea and in the northern part of the Mediterranean Sea. There is so an announcement about the knowledge concerning impact anchoring, and uh, there is the implementation of the MPN. Uh, with the idea of the MPN, it's to ensure uh, cons consistency uh, among regulation between all the country, to promote compliance with uh, them through uh, monitoring, and to evaluate the effect on Posidonia preservation. So uh, the aim of the study uh, was to what is the current knowledge of Posidonia distribution, because it's a key point. If you want to really protect, you have to know where are the Posidonia, where is distributed, uh, which are the legal tools that existing for Posidonia protection, and are there regulation on anchoring, because it seems it's a, a major threat. Uh, the idea was to highlight gaps and uh, to give some recommendations to protect more efficiently the meadow from at least this uh, pressure for, of anchoring. What we have done is first a report that you can read if you are interested, a geodatabase with the distribution of Posidonia Meadow and MPA, a spreadsheet with experts and institutions involved in each country, a scientific publication list about this topic, and a brochure in Arabic, French, and English in order to summarize the result of this study. Concerning the distribution of Posidonia and MPA, we use the data of Telesca uh, of 2015, or if they are available, some more recent data. Uh, for instance, it was the case for Corsica, it was the case for Liguria, and uh, we have tried to uh, make all these elements. So you have this sort of thing. Uh, I take the example of uh, Balearic Island, and uh, you, you see there is the... Uh, I am not sure if... No, it doesn't function. You have the meadow here in green around the island. Uh, we used uh, for the MPA the database of MAPAMED uh, actualized in 2019, and we made a distinction between the national MPA in blue and the Natura 2000 or RAM site because it's different in terms of uh, uh, regulation. Uh, the idea at the end it was to have a percentage of overlapping between the meadow and this protected area. Is there meadow inside the MPA? Is there meadow inside Natura 2000 or Ramsar site? Or are they outside? So with less protection, uh, in fact. About the regulatory, regulatory protection of Posidonia, 
you can have national regulation, so, um, some law about uh, the inscription of a species on the list of protected species. You can have indirect protection because you have some law in relation with certain use. For instance, you can have information in some country that it is prohibited to uh, use uh, trolling on a Posidonia menu, which is not dedicated for the meadow, but it's a mean to protect air. Uh, there is so international agreement with the Habitat Fauna Flora Directive for a European country, the Bern Convention that can be more larger than the European country, and sure, the SPABIDI protocol that all you know, all of you know. If we made this on the, on, the, on the map, you have some country with lack of Posidonia. You see, for instance, about uh, Morocco, uh, about uh, Syria and Libya, and, you, and uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. For the other country, there is uh, some country with national specific protection, like uh, Spain, uh, France, Algeria, or you have so uh, indirect protection from, uh, for instance, in Greece with this uh, uh, element concerning uh, trolling, concerning aquaculture installation, and so on. And you can have so uh, some country just with the protection of the SPA BD protocol and the Annex 2 of the SPA BD protocol with the inscription of Posidonia in the Annex 2. Some countries, very few, have specific regulation concerning anchoring, uh, for instance, uh, in uh, Spain, where in some part of the country, the, the anchoring of a boat is uh, prohibited in some area. About the result of the overlapping between MPA and uh, Posidonia bed, you have the result by country. You see that the result can be uh, used, for instance, uh, uh, for France, Spain, etc., because you have a percentage of Posidonia inside uh, the, nat the national MPA and a part which is in fact, not protected by this sort of protection, just because uh, it's uh, too, uh, too uh, a part which is uh, above, uh, outside this uh, specially protected area. The element with a white circle must be taken with caution because, in fact, we have no uh, global map of the meadow, so the covering is not really uh, the reality. It's the particular tool for Turkey. We have just some part of uh, information about the distribution of map of Posidonia Medo in Turkey. And you, it seems that 100 more or less percent of the Medo are inside, but it's not the reality. It's just that we have just MPA map. So all the Medo uh, are effectively in this uh, position. Concerning solution and monitoring plan cons uh, concerning ensuring, some countries have no regulation, but they do something. And they, uh, for instance, do uh, in their uh, marine protected area, they can avoid uh, anchoring, you see the red anchor. They have a sis uh, eco mooring system implemented with a, a green anchor, or they use so uh, application, web application like Donia, that allow uh, people to uh, define before anchoring if there is sand, if there is meadow or other uh, substrate. There is so uh, some country that have more in monitoring plan for anchoring. You have a country uh, here. So a few number of countries and a lack of monitoring on Posidonia in Egypt, Libya, and Turkey. Uh, general monitoring, it's not linked to anchoring for uh, the other country. And for instance, in uh, Croatia, France, Greece, Italy, Malta, Spain, Turkey, you have studies concerning the anchoring. So the situation is quite different. About the uh, conclusion, it's that there is a scarce av availability of national cartography, uh, especially in Eastern and Southern countries. It's not new. Uh, there is a lack of regulation and legislation on anchoring activity on Posidonia Meadow and poor monitoring plan. Uh, 
So the recommendation was to implement cartography, to develop and enforce regulation, and to spread the best practice. And finally, to promote ecological uh, moving, facilitate their use because there is some administrative difficulties, and to raising awareness about the public about all these elements. Following uh, all these elements, the, a key question appears is a restoration or re implantation a new solution to better protect the meadow? It's not new because the first experiments are in the 70s. What is important, so, it's that there is an increase of the thematic restoration in European programs since 10 years. And I don't speak about all the programs, all the existing programs, but just I will focus on two uh, programs, one on the safe anchoring seagrass protection in the Adriatic Sea, SASPAS, where there is an initiative to make some re-implantation in pilot uh, uh, test and uh, one on uh, CEPOSO, which is a supporting environmental governance for the Posidonia Oceanica sustainable transplanting operation. The ID is a, a national program for Italy uh, to have some uh, information about what is needed, what is exacting, uh, is it possible to, to, to make reimplantation, can be efficiency, and so on. According to this element, we have tried before this meeting to uh, send you an inquiry. Some of you have responded, and uh, I, I will thank all the person who will take time to, to, to answer to this inquiry. The panel initially was uh, 90 persons, scientists and MPN members, and we have a list of the main uh, question, main topic in this questionnaire. I don't go directly in deep in this element. The idea is just to say that if you want after the meeting to uh, fulfill to this uh, questionnaire, it's always possible. Uh, you can send me an email and I will uh, send you. About the main result, we have 20 answer, which is few, but it's normal for, not, norm, for a questionnaire for an inquiry because it's 24% for eight country. Uh, the people who answer in majority, 86%, are the real life experiments. So if you have no experience, effectively, you, you doesn't answer to the inquiry. What is interesting is to say about the origin of the people who answer is that in majority, it concerns North European uh, Mediterranean Sea, uh, North uh, Western sorry, uh, Mediterranean Sea, and Adriatic Sea, because uh, you are from Croatia, Montenegro, and uh, Italy with the Adriatic part. So, 63% uh, of the person who experienced uh, uh, this uh, reforestation have made communication. So. In fact, there is a lack of information, and this lack of information is due because most of the study are ongoing. Uh, you have 60% of the experiment we are ongoing, 24% uh, ended since one year, and uh, just 17% uh, ended since more than one year. So, it's really uh, a common uh, discussion at this level. About the result, you have very different protocols that have been used. I don't, go, I don't go in deep for this point, but you have difference in the material used. Uh, you can have cutting, you can have natural recolonization, you have a seed, you have so uh, all the plants with the substrate. Uh, very few examples on this tip, but they, they exist. You have differences in fixation. Uh, you can have cement quadrat, metallic metallic grid, bioplastic, and so on, uh, cocoa fiber carpet, uh, with different results. About uh, the, the protocol, what is in, seems important, it's to the, the site with a wide variability of depth between 3 and 30 meter depth, even the maximum are around 10, 15 meter depth. The size, you have some uh, experiment, very pilot uh, test in uh, some square meter, until uh, 10,000 square meter. The number 
of cutting, you can have uh, since uh, 60,000 uh, cutting used. The substrate, usually it's dead mat or sand, but you have some experiment on rocks. There is always an existing meadow in the past on the site that have been tested. If we speak about the origin of irrigation, uh, it seems that most uh, important irrigation are linked to physical damage. If we go in deep for this physical damage, uh, you have several uh, cases. The, uh, the Costa Concordia shipwreck, which is a, a very well documented uh, do element. The anchoring, which is the majority, more or less 75% uh, of the physical damage are linked to anchoring. And you have so mooring, trolling, and some not identified uh, physical damage. But in several cases, the threats are not solved. So we can be a bit surprised by the fact that some people want to make experiments even if the, the, the threats are not solved. About the monitoring, uh, there is an important uh, monitoring 90% um, of the experiment have been monitored annually, twice a year, quarterly or monthly. You see that in fact, it's usually annually or twice a year, but usually this monitoring is very short because it does not exceed three years. About the number of parameters, many uh, parameters are taken into account with the maximum for survival rate and number of shoot or density. About the rate of survival, you can find very different results between 42 and 100 percent after one year to 0, 31 percent after four years. So, what is important, in fact, that if you have just a survey during three years, you, you can conclude that all is okay because you can have 90, 89 percent of uh, success. The cost is very different and difficult to compare between 4 and 14 euro by shoot. So that represent more or less between 15 and uh, six, uh, 660 uh, euro by square meter. With a problem that in one meter you can put 10 shoot or you can put 100 shoot. So it's not the same job and it's not the same price. According to the funding, usually it's a mix of funding between public, private, and uh, donation or uh, something like that. And what is interesting, so only 12% uh, of the experiment are compensatory methods. What is finally uh, necessary to prohibit, and I will uh, stop on this point, with the uh, answer, it seems that the first point is transplant must be prohibited in unprotected site or with impact not solved. Second point, it's transplant in an appropriate site, for instance, a, a site without existing meadow previously. The third point is what restoration does not allow destruction. Restoration so is not a compensatory, compensatory action. And this point is really important from, uh, from many countries. Restoration must be envisaged after over action, like eco mooring, like awareness, like uh, uh, decreasing of the threats on the meadow. And in fact, it's you have not to believe in miracles. The growth of the meadow is very slow and you can say, yes, I can put experiment and tomorrow all will be perfect. So it's a key point. Now, now the floor is yours and I, I want to, to give you the opportunity to share your experience, to, to ask, to say about your, your need, your expectation in uh, restoration action. Thank you very much. <laughs> so please, what is interesting now is to say what is necessary to do before initiating transplanting. What is necessary to do for transplant is not the key point for me today because many methods have been published. What is necessary after 
transplantation to be uh, sure that this method is useful and can help you. So we have more or less uh, 30 minutes to, to discuss about this point. I know that there is some people who have experience on this topic in the room. So please don't hesitate to, to speak. And even person that doesn't know, because it's always important to, to know your expectation. Bonjour. Uh, alors, je voudrais parler de... Please give your name before, uh, in order to, to not, and to have after discussion with you if necessary. Okay. Rim Zaham, de la Faculté des sciences de Tunis. Donc, on est en train de démarrer un projet de restauration d'herbiers de, de, de posidonie, de réimplantation en Tunisie. Et uh, on est en, en plein uh, problème. On est en, en, en train d'être conf, confronté à beaucoup de problèmes. Euh, D'abord, pour le choix du site. Le choix du site qui nous pose un problème parce que, euh, comme vous l'avez dit, euh, il faut que la source de pollution soit, euh, on est sûr que ça soit enlevé. Euh, alors, j'ai quelques questions par rapport euh, aux expériences qui ont été montrées, à quelle profondeur euh, les opérations de réimplantation ont été faites. Euh, euh, J'ajouterai aussi que nous, on veut expérimenter une autre technique, euh, autre que les, les. Bien sûr, on va utiliser certaines techniques qui ont été utilisées, mais on va aussi utiliser euh, des euh, tapis euh, faits avec de l'alpha, une plante qui est présente en Tunisie, peu chère. Et donc, on voudrait expérimenter aussi. Et donc, je voudrais savoir les, les autres, s'il y a d'autres personnes ici qui ont expérimenté avec des plantes de la fibre naturelle et euh, comment on doit, euh, on doit envisager. En tout cas, euh, je suis venue ici euh, pour parler de la réimplantation, pour euh, voir les autres expér expériences et euh, avoir un réseau pour m'aider à réussir l'expérience en Tunisie. Merci. Oui. Euh, si je peux répondre sur l'aspect profondeur, euh, je dirais traditionnellement, le but, c'est de faire ça à une profondeur intermédiaire de 10 à 15 mètres parce que de façon très superficielle, il va y avoir un problème d'hydrodynamisme et donc ça suppose qu'effectivement la fixation des plans euh, soit, euh, je dirais, très importante euh, parce que sinon on a beaucoup de, de difficultés. C'est ce qui a été présenté hier aussi par des collègues sur les cystosaires ou sur les fucales. Euh, par contre, au-delà de 10-15 mètres de profondeur, le problème que l'on a, ça va être le temps d'investir je dirais, de travail sur le fond, puisqu'on va être limité, évidemment, par la possibilité. Donc, plus on est profond et plus on va augmenter le coût, en fait, et la difficulté pour mener à bien les expérimentations. Mais euh, les expérimentations à 20 ou 25 mètres ne donnent pas de plus mauvais résultats qu'à 10 ou 15 mètres. Euh, voilà, pour cet aspect temps. Pour euh, les autres aspects, c'est-à-dire euh, fibres naturelles, il y a des essais qui ont été faits et euh, je pense qu'effectivement, de toute façon, ça mérite d'être expérimenté. Euh, la grosse difficulté, c'est d'assurer en fait que les boutures sont bien fixées le temps que euh, la plante euh, ben, mette en place, je dirais, un système racinaire qui lui permet de suffisamment s'ancrer sur le substrat. Donc, euh, ça demande un certain temps et surtout, surtout ça demande des réserves d'énergie. Il y a une demande de parole par euh, visio. Donc, euh, techniquement… Marie, tu es là Oui, oui. vous m'entendez Est-ce que vous m'entendez On la voit, mais… Vous m'entendez Ok. C'est bon Bonjour à tous. Um, je vais parler en anglais. Um, I wanted to know if the scientific community was already involved or at least heard about the recently published proposal for the regulation of the European Parliament that was published uh, in June, I think, on nature restoration. So this is a regulation, this is legally binding, uh, way more binding than uh, European directives. 
And this project states that 30% of the European territory should be covered by restoration measures by 2030 and 90% of the territory by 2050. So this is very ambitious. And I wanted to know if the scientific community was aware and involved. And if you're not aware, be prepared because it's gonna be big. Hello, Marie. Um, well, about the scientific community, well, now they have the information if they, did, <laughs> if they didn't know. Uh, we had a discussion with the European Commission recently about what was integrated in terms of restoration. We, and they assured us that restoration was not only um, active restoration. That means that I mean, I don't think that's the debate today, but by restoration of Poisonia, we also, uh, the preliminary is to get rid of the pressures and get rid of the pressures and protect Poisonia. If you anyway do transplanting, you need to have these actions. So in the restoration plan of the European Commission, it will be integrated normally measures and budget for protection and what some scientists call passive restoration. Paolo Guidetti, Stazione Zoologica Anton Dorn. Euh, moi, j'avais trois points. Euh, que, que, euh, la première question que je voulais poser est euh, est-ce qu'on a des données concernant le succès des transplantations, mais je ne dis pas cinq ans après, dix ans après, mais trente ans après Car on en fait partout, une transplantation, mais j'ai l'impression que parfois, parfois, sinon assez souvent, le monitoring soit fait dans le court terme. Après cinq ans, on a les plantes un peu marron, mais après 30 ans, on ne sait pas ce qui se passe. Alors qu'un système de posidonie, vous le savez, bon, on le sait bien, c'est un système qui est centenaire, millénaire. Donc, si 30 ans après, en moyenne, la transplantation n'a pas de succès, je ne sais pas si ça vaut le coup de continuer à en faire, quelle que soit la situation euh, qu'on a. Car la nature se tire bien hein, des, des problèmes toute seule si on ne si on la gêne pas. L'autre point est que je me demande, moi je ne travaille plus sur les AMP que sur les posidonies dans le passé, je l'ai fait, mais si on devait, nous tous, commencer à faire un monitoring sur les autorités comme la Guardia Costiera, les affaires maritimes, si parfois elles font bien leur devoir. Car en ayant travaillé dans plusieurs bon, euh, pays dans la Méditerranée, dans certains sites qui sont Natura 2000, etc., on voit tous les jours de l'année des centaines des petits bateaux, des grands bateaux, des yachts qui jettent les encres dans des zones où on ne devait pas. Donc, je pense qu'en tant, en tant que scientifique, nous, on a fait vraiment notre devoir en ayant récolté des données, des évidences de tous les types des encres, les impacts qu'ils produisent. Mais après, si on jette un œil à tout ce qui se passe tous les jours, on voit tout le, tout le temps des bateaux qui jette l'encre. Donc, je pense qu'il y a un déficit de contrôle à mer qui a généralisé. Et le dernier point est que, et là, Leonardo, peut-être que tu peux me donner un coup de main dans ce, dans ce, pour ce, sur ce point. J'ai l'impression que aussi, ce soit le ministère de plusieurs pays qui demande des compensations en termes de transplantation de posidonie, alors qu'on fait des travaux impactants. Euh, on prolonge euh, un port, mais ailleurs, il faut transplanter les posidonies comme compensation, alors qu'il y a des soucis en termes de, de mm, herbier donateur par rapport. <rire> bon, parfois, j'ai l'impression qu'on fait plus de dégâts sur les sites donateurs par rapport à la transplantation. Merci. Je réponds rapidement. Je suis tout à fait d'accord. Uh, I, I totally agree with you about the third point. Uh, it's sure that it's not necessarily the solution of restoration. And I am not here to say we must restore. I am here to say what is the situation and what can we do. I totally agree with the two points about the fact that we there is some regulation at the 
national level in each country of the Mediterranean Sea. And in fact, they are not effective. And yes, but I am not the policy, I'm not the carabinier, and I'm not <laughs> in capacity to change this. I think it's a political point of view. According to example of France, in France, the species is protected and since 1988. Until last year, there is nothing. You can anchoring on Posidonia Meadow and doesn't thing uh, appear. But they finally, the, 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 Mar the maritime prefects decide last year to create new decree and to say, yes, now it's forbidden to put the boat more than 24 meters in this area where there is Posidonia Meadow. We made some map. We made a zone where is it possible to anchor in. We made a new system for the boat, et cetera. And it became true. But it's a, a national decision, and it will be important to, to share this, uh, this view. And for the third point, I don't remember the, the question. Yes. But there is few examples because there is uh, only one example of 11 years, but 30 years, no. Nobody have said 30 years old, yes, we, we can restore. And My. Micro. I would say it would, it would be nice to go in the places where transplantation have been done decades ago and see what happens there. Yeah. Uh, merci, Charles-François Boudouresque. Uh, je voudrais dire que je partage complètement les questions que vient de poser Paolo Guidetti, en particulier, que sont devenues les transplantations anciennes tu parles de 11 années, mais nous savons bien, et d'ailleurs nous les avons citées dans une publication euh, commune dans Water, euh, avec euh, plusieurs personnes qui sont ici, des transplantations qui ont eu lieu il y a 40 ans, 50 ans, je pense que la plus ancienne date de 60 ans, en des sites que nous connaissons, il y en a eu en Italie, il y en a eu en France, il y en a eu dans d'autres pays, et nous l'avons d'ailleurs dit, en fait, personne, on pourrait, personne n'est retourné sur ces sites, et d'ailleurs, euh, en fait, nous savons bien que sur ces sites, personne n'est capable de montrer, voilà, regardez, cet immense herbier, c'est celui que nous avons re replanté en 1970, ou en 1980, donc non, ça ne date pas de 11 ans, ça date de 60 ans, les réimplantations sur des sites qui ont été, bon, il n'y avait pas de GPS, mais sur des sites qui ont été bien identifiés. Ça, c'est la première chose et je partage complètement ce que dit Paolo. La deuxième question qu'il pose, c'est évidemment l'application de la réglementation. Alors, c'est facile de dire, nous sommes des scientifiques et euh, nous avons alerté, nous avons fait le job, on a publié nos résultats dans des grandes revues internationales, tout le monde peut lire nos travaux, mais en fait, dans les les slides que euh, qu a présenté euh, Frédéric et toi, eh bien, on voit des, des zones protégées, Natura 2000. Est-ce que Natura 2000 est protégée C'est une question qui peut se discuter. Euh, DMPA, DMPA, etc. Mais on sait très bien que tout autour de la Méditerranée, euh, que ce soit dans les pays de l'Union européenne ou que ce soit dans des pays qui n'appartiennent pas à l'Union européenne, eh bien, euh, la réglementation, quand elle existe, 
de toutes les façons, n'est pas appliquée. Alors, c'est vrai, est-ce que la première chose à faire, ce ne serait pas une, cette sorte de fuite en avant euh, pour euh, accumuler du papier, des, des belles idées, est-ce que la première chose à faire finalement, c'est nous révolter contre cette non-application de la loi La Méditerranée est-elle une zone de non-droit, comme certaines banlieues euh, européennes en termes d'application de, de la législation Et ça, moi, je pense que c'est… Je, je suis désolé de parler si longtemps, mais franchement, c'est le problème fondamental, l'application de la loi. Et juste un petit mot pour notre collègue de Tunis concernant la profondeur. Eh bien, je voudrais ajouter à ce qu'a dit Christine sur les faibles profondeurs. Eh bien, il se pose aussi moins pour la posidonie que pour la simodocée, mais c'est flagrant pour la simodocée. Il se pose le problème des herbivores. Les principaux herbivores méditerranéens, euh, Sarpa, Salpa, Paracentrotus, Lividus, sont généralement cantonnés aux zones peu profondes. Donc, euh, c'est une raison supplémentaire d'éviter évidemment les zones peu profondes et le problème des herbivores que nous avons vu hier d'ailleurs avec les transplantations de Fucal. Ok. Uh, Francesca Rossi, CNRS. So I go back to the science. <laughs> so, but before maybe uh, a message to the Italians. Uh, on Sunday, vote uh, Green Party, so we can have some regulation in Italy as well. And uh, so uh, my question is about uh, if we can find uh, some sort of um, best uh, special scale at which we, we can uh, uh, have more success in restoration. Looking at the examples for, from Zostera, for instance, they, have, they are a bit more advanced, I think, also because Zostera reacts faster. Um, they, have, they have seen that uh, there is uh, this um, positive feedback of the plant ex itself because it decreases, for instance, hydrodynamics if we have enough space uh, transplanted. Uh, and so I don't know if for Posidonia, we have the same uh, uh, type of uh, scientific information and whether uh, the surroundings also matter, meaning for instance, that if we, if we transplant, of course, when you have an anchoring, you transplant within a meadow. So probably the success would be much better than if we try to restore a completely bare uh, patch. So do we have this uh, scientific information? Do we need them? Like, no, uh, I have no information about this. Uh, but I agree with the fact it's better to put inside the meadow, but usually according to the cost, uh, when there is problem of degradation, the people try to solve the system between made new experiment that where there is no posidonia. And a key point is to be sure before transplanting that there is natural recolonization in the seagrass uh, in the vicinity of the of experiment. Uh, je passe la question. J'avais juste une petite réponse. Sonra. <rire> on, a, on a Thomas en ligne qui veut intervenir. Ok. Yes, thank you, good morning. Thomas Bocquel, uh, Andromède Oceanology, France. I just have a quick question about the source of the material used for restoration. We, uh, we are currently uh, doing some experiments where we take uh, the fragments uh, that we take some fragments that were previously removed by Jane cores. So we don't cut from the, the meadow. And this is 
this is a long process underwater because we have to choose the good fragments. And we sometimes have uh, good results, sometimes less good results. And uh, one of our hypotheses is that this could be due to the quality of the fragments. So I have two questions. Um, how does the Posidonia experts see the, the fact of taking Posidonia, cutting Posidonia from the meadow? Is that, I don't know, is that okay? Is that uh, something we can do? And uh, if it is, do we have study that proves that uh, there is no impact of doing this? And finally, I know it's uh, quite difficult for us already to have the authorization to do the restoration. So I don't even imagine to have the authorization to cut from the meadow. That's the third question. Thank you. <clears throat> oui. Alors, plusieurs euh, points sur lesquels je voulais intervenir, je vais finir par les oublier, mais bon, je, là, pour répondre rapidement sur les aspects boutures, je renvoie effectivement au papier dont parlait Charles-François sur l'aspect éthique des, des transplantations, et c'est vraiment un point qui est important d'essayer d'avoir de, le moins d'impact possible sur les herbiers donneurs, et les, les faisceaux en épave sont une des solutions qui peuvent être développées. Par contre, je voulais quand même signaler que lors d'études précédentes, notamment faites par Ike Molenard dans le cadre de sa thèse, elle avait fait des prélèvements dans un herbier donneur le long d'une limite, elle est retournée deux ans après pour remesurer la densité à l'endroit où avaient été prélevés les faisceaux et on avait une densité égale, voire même supérieure, un petit peu comme quand on élague des arbres, on avait augmenté un petit peu la vitesse de croissance et la division des faisceaux. Donc, de ce côté-là, ça serait un point un peu plutôt positif si les faisceaux ne sont pas prélever tous au même endroit, qu'on respecte une certaine distance, l'impact sur un herbier sain n'est pas très important, tout au moins, et je dirais, est quelque chose qui est assez anodin. Par contre, un point très important qu'a soulevé Paolo, c'est le retour sur site. Charles-François l'a dit aussi. Nous, on a la thèse d'Aïc Molénard qui s'est faite il y a des années, mais on n'a pas, et je suis désolé de le dire, on n'a pas les financements pour retourner. On a déjà du mal à avoir un suivi pendant 3-4 ans en termes de financement, mais alors quand on leur parle de 10-20 ans, c'est impossible. Or, c'est effectivement là qu'on aura les, les réponses que l'on n'a pas aujourd'hui. Et je profite pour faire un appel aux, aux décideurs, aux gestionnaires, on peut, il faut arrêter de financer des expériences, que ce soit des réseaux de surveillance, que ce soit des transplantations, les suivre pendant cinq ans, allez, dans le meilleur des cas, et puis après, ben, on n'a plus, plus d'argent, on laisse tomber et on refait une nouvelle expérience ailleurs. On a besoin de séries chronologiques longues pour pouvoir apporter des réponses et actuellement, c'est impossible dans le, les financements que l'on obtient. Voilà. Hi everyone, I am Andrea Tursi. I am from the Bar University. I would like to briefly share my experience in this field. We tried one month ago to transplant some areas of Posidonia oceanica meadows at Tremidia Islands Marine Protected Area. And I will say that it's really hard. It took about 10 days of work. We dived about three or four times a day. And we noticed that even when we were working, several boats were anchoring where they couldn't do that. So I think that the most important thing is to um, inform people, even in marine protected areas, that they cannot anchor on Positon Oceanica because we, um, we transplanted about 100 meters square. And we observed a few days ago that some patches of what we transplanted were, uh, were attacked by anchoring only a few days ago. So you risk to spend a lot of money and a lot of time. And a few days ago, you just throw away everything just because people do not know that they, uh, this, this is Posidonia underwater. And we also tried to inform population of the marine protected area, distributing some uh, information map with the distribution of Posidonia Oceanica and with the areas where they do not can do, do not anchor. And but it, it didn't work. So I think that uh, transplanting is a noble thing, 
but it's really hard to do and you risk really to throw away money and time unless you really work on uh, on population in marine protected area and on tourism um, and on recreational boating. Thank you. Uh, I'm Smash Shakman, uh, Tribune University from Libya. Regarding to the, the presentation, there are some lack information in Libya. I am not expert in uh, this issue, but uh, although there is some projects in uh, Pisidonia and this ecosystem in the Libyan coast collaborated with uh, Sparak, and but we need uh, in Libya we need um, to how to protect the uh, and uh, we need accurate uh, distribution along the Libyan coast for these ecosystems and after that we need to mitigate the treated because there are some. Uh, some dated uh, like pollution and climatic change. This is the main issue that I would talk about. Thank you. Oui, bonjour à tous. Uh, je m'appelle Fabrice, je suis le directeur de la réserve marine de Capo Carbonara en, en Sardaigne. Donc, uh, Euh, moi, je vais partager mon expérience en termes de transplantation de Porzidonie. En fait, euh, en 2015, le, on a eu le, le projet LAIF, il s'appelle Resma Aris. Euh, en fait, c'est finalisé la transplantation de de, de Porzidonie. Donc, c'est un projet qui a eu un succès très important au niveau du communauté européen. En fait, on est encore euh, après cinq ans on post life parce que la communauté européenne a retenu très important le projet et surtout la technique qu'on a utilisée pour pour essayer de transplanter le, le plante de de Posidonie. Donc ça c'est déjà important pour la collègue tunisienne qui veut savoir si si le transplantation est bien euh, il, il démarre bien il a, il a bien démarré et il commence et il, est, il est toujours en train de bien démarrer de, de se développer donc la réponse est oui on a en publication à niveau international donc si on peut la partager euh, les trois deuxièmes points sont vite sont la réponse à Paolo euh, donc oui nous on suit le la transplantation gratuitement parce que entre les finalités de la réserve il y a aussi la, la conservation de la gouvernance de euh, tout ce qui est marin côtière donc oui on travaille parce qu'on veut suivre euh, le, le projet Resmaris le life Resmaris mais on veut travailler sur euh, le long terme monitoring en termes de euh, avoir plus de données sur les sites où on a travaillé pendant le temps. Donc, tous, euh, tous ces petits projets aussi, euh, on a plusieurs projets financés par des sociétés privées. Euh, et nous, on travaille beaucoup avec une fondation qui est née quelques années en Sardaigne, c'est Medsi Foundation. Euh, les présidents se sur la sur ça c'est le secrétaire exécutif de Medwet je sais pas peut-être quelqu'un il connaisse et donc euh, avec lui on travaille beaucoup sur, sur des sur la transplantation sur des autres sites mais les problèmes en, en Sardaigne comme en Italie c'est à niveau du loi en fait si on a des parcs nationaux ou on a des réserves euh, bien sûr il, il y a la possibilité d'avoir des amendes sur les euh, sur les propriétaires du bateau. Si on a euh, des sites comme Nature 2000, on n'a pas le droit de euh, avoir des amendes, de donner des amendes aux au propriétaires du, du bateau. C'est ça le problème. Donc, soit on est des réserves des AMP, soit la loi, il ne donne, donne pas la possibilité de euh, donner des amendes. Et tout, tout le monde encore, ils ne connaissent pas la différence de, entre algues et plantes, entre la gendarmerie en mer, comme Paul le disait. Et donc, euh, on est très loin, on est très loin, mais je vous dis, on est très loin de notre intérêt de protéger, la, euh, protéger le rubier ou toutes les espèces qui rentrent dans des directives 
comme les directives Habitat. Euh, voilà. Donc, euh, le problème, c'est encore à la base. Nous, on, on travaille beaucoup euh, sur l'herbier, sur, sur tout ce qui est euh, Posidonie à 360 degrés. Mais à la fin, la gendarmerie, je vous dis, parce que je suis gestionnaire d'une réserve, peut-être une des plus grandes en Italie. Euh, voilà, le problème, c'est que la gendarmerie, ils ne donnent pas des amendes parce qu'ils ne connaissent pas déjà à la base qu'est-ce que c'est le... Euh, euh, voilà, donc, euh, donc ça, c'est un petit euh, <rire> euh, problème qui, qui j'essaye de gérer euh, chaque jour, mais on n'arrive on arrive pas. Nous, on n'a pas, par exemple, des activités de la gendarmerie en termes de donner des amendes. Euh, nous, on n'a pas. Donc, ils il travaillent beaucoup sur les sur les plaisanciers, sur, des, euh, euh, sur la, la violation de loi au niveau du réserve marine, le, la pêche, euh, le, 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 le des bateaux et tout ça, mais pas sur la pied. Donc, euh, on travaille sur la protection, sur la transplantation, mais à la base, il n'y a pas une loi qui nous permettra dans le futur, pour l'instant, d'avoir euh, la possibilité de protéger en termes de, euh, de le, en termes de, des amendes. Euh, voilà, euh, merci pour l'organisation. Donc, si quelqu'un a des questions, je suis à disposition. Merci. Okay. Hello to everyone. I'm Vesna Matic from Montenegro. Just, uh, a few days ago, I heard about uh, Posidonia Network, and, and I'm, I'm the last uh, member so far, probably. Uh, I would be happy to share some new uh, information for Montenegro. Since last year, we have uh, three new MPAs, so some Posidonia medals are protected, at least on the paper. Uh, I don't have experience with the restoration of Posidonia, but um, I think it's uh, very slow, very costly. We are not certain what is going on. And uh, uh, I think that we as a biologist are choosing maybe to, 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 to play with that. And also because it is easier for us than to talk with the politicians, to decision makers, to inspectors. Because we, I think, all agree that anchoring is damaging Posidonia, and if we stop that uh, activity, we will uh, have more success probably in the protection of Posidonia than with all uh, restoration and transplantation. But uh, we are somehow speaking different language. We are biologists. But when we go in the field and uh, when we have to implement some laws that are already existing, then uh, I think at least in my case, that is the most difficult uh, the part. Thank you. Uh, and yes, I confirm you so far the last member, the latest not the last, the latest <laughs> member of the MPN. Uh, just a quick answer about this thing. Um, and it also will answer the question and why uh, the... Uh, I mean, yeah, I understand why we all... Um, Posidonia is protected theoretically in most countries in the Metsi, but we, uh, factually, that's not enough. That's why uh, we actually started to engage two, two things via the MPN is first um, we need to raise awareness about the judges and the Ministry of Justice of each country about this issue because most of them don't know what is Posidonia and when we speak with them we had the case in France they told us we need science to support our decisions and that's in the sense I, I transferred the call that they told me like we have now a science proved that the impact of um, big anchors destroys you know, Posidonia. Uh, so when they go to the judge they, with the lawyers, they can support it. For instance, for small anchors, it's a bit more difficult to, when you have in front of you the lawyer of a rich uh, owner of a small boat, it's more complicated to, to have arguments, what they told me. And another point as well is to prove how much is worth Posidonia. We have uh, maybe maybe changes recently, but 
we have a lot of publications giving the number between 500 and and 500,000 euros per year per hectare if i'm not wrong uh so we kind of say it's between 50 100,000 euros per year per hectare the value of posidonia but there are so many publications and not uh, only one value well if i am a lawyer it's easy to say to the judge look it's not sure what they say so uh, how much is the composition so but basically it's important to, to say that we have to do more with the ministry of justice but we also need to listen to the calls and especially they need you they need science to support their own decision when you got the the, the lawyer in front of you last question thank you thank you so much hello i am daniele university of rome la sapienza uh, i would like to, sh to share just uh, a little part of my experience uh, on Giglio island because i saw that in your pie graph is a small slice on uh, transplantation results um, to be honest i think that our work in that area is easier compared to other transplantation activities because uh, uh, the impact is uh, an exceptional event. So after the removal of that impact, the natural conditions are totally restored. And this is a very important point. Uh, but I would like to shed um, lights on uh, unexpected part of this transplantation because uh, we experience uh, um, something, uh, something strange, um, uh, that is a very uh, high activity of grazing by Salema on transplanting cuttings. So uh, in, this, in, this, in this case, uh, a natural event, the, the grazing, could impact the transplantation results. Uh, I don't know if also in other transplanting project the same as uh, happen. I don't know, but uh, we have to, to think about it because after the first year, the survival of cuttings was reduced by 5% only due to the grazing activity by the Salema. So <laughs> no problem linked to say, climate change, anchoring, because the area is totally protected, but due to a, a naturally, naturally species. So I think it is interesting to, to work on. <laughs> Thank you for all this element. I'm sorry that we are obliged to stop this discussion. We can do uh, outside the, 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 this floor. Uh, I give the floor from uh, Frédéric for the conclusion, and uh, we can contact uh, you. Can contact me if you want about this element. Thank you very much. Um, I just I just need a slide. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for all this um, discussion. It's uh, what we try to to try uh, to give a quick summary of some ideas or suggestions we we have. If we try to to summarize Posidonia and how what should be the operational per, uh, perspectives for Posidonia, in a sense we have we can see Posidonia as uh, three different stages. One are uh, areas where you have Poisonia in good state and no pressure. It's quite rare now, but we still have it. So you basically the action is to protect it before destruction and even use it as a refer referent site. Then most of the time we have Poisonia under pressure. It can be anchoring, pollution, coastal structures, whatever. Well, the action is to eliminate the pressure and if you eliminate the pressure, it's also to protect it. And the last time, last part is you have prison, you have prison your habitat in not such a good state, I would say, but the pressure has been eliminated. There was before anchoring, now there's a, a law to ban bots. So that's potentially areas where you can think of restoration. So basically, we, in a sense, need to have like three different types of maps with these three different options to know what to do. And when we think to do to complete a map, 
uh, it's also we yesterday and we saw that the map of Poisonia is incomplete in some areas, so it's quite important to 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 finish and complete the map in uh, in some countries. To and to be able to also do it via adapted and cost-effective uh, protocol. Coming back to restoration, again, we can separate, in a sense, restoration in three different cases. There has been experiences in the past where you restore Pozidonia in areas where Pozidonia never was present in the past. There has been a lot of experiments that so far have been um, more generally a failure. So the question arises, should we stop this type of experiments? Like, should we start stop trying to restore Poisdonia in an area where it's never been Poisdonia? The second option is sometimes we restore Poisdonia because we build a harbor, we build something. So we take Poisdonia, we transplant it in an area where before it was there was some Poisdonia. Again, there was some experiences in the past. The results were are in discussion. And but after 50 years, this type of things, it's not completely operational even. And the last point is well, with the impact of big uh, boats or, or small boats, when you have a lot of small boats, what do we do with the issue of anchoring? now that's what the person was showing in the powerpoint most of the experiments are in this area so the question is now is it considered like research and development or operational that's a crew issue because depending on what we conclude we won't have the same strategy hi and one of the questions is how do we value and define the efficiency of restoration in a sense what we need is collectively to share guidelines to define what are the conditions to restore. That means, yes, preliminary is most probably to have the site with no more pressure. Uh, accept that it's not a project related to compensation. It would be terrible to accept the destruction of Posidonia to build something and uh, saying that that's okay, I can transplant it. Uh, the question also we most of the time try to answer is what's the added value of restoration against natural protection? Most of the time we see Poisonia is come, sometimes it's coming back because not only we, we transplant, but we also protect. So maybe if we just protect, what's the, in terms of cost effectiveness, what's the added value to restore? So it's try to, to give also some options for that. And then once we define the condition to restore, what's important is to see what is research and development so research and development needs to be encouraged it's innovation uh, but again what is the protocol we should set up how do we monitor how long do we how long do we have to monitor to to conclude some results what should be forbidden and then if collectively we decide this thing is operational so that means great we now have a concrete solution to restore poisonia in some areas. So now it's where do we do it? How do we do it? With we who is going to finance? How are we gonna govern this uh, this issue? So there, there are a lot of issues about Poisdonia restoration, and that's why we decided via the the, the MPN and uh, with the car to to work on um, collective guidelines to be able to write for, by next year some guidelines that we can share uh, all together to see what shall we say to decision makers when they speak about restoration. So basically, that's uh, that's a call today. Also, I wanted to finish by, by this thing is we gave uh, this mission to to, to, <laughs> to Christine and but not only her, the idea is to co-build all together uh, guidelines on how to restore and most importantly, what shouldn't we accept? And if we accept what is research and development, what is operational restoration to be able to help and guide the future scientists. So this thing is for next year. So for everyone who is interested in to, to work on the project, please uh, contact uh, Christine. 
and more generally about the MPN and the Mediterranean Prison Network. It's a really open network. It's free. Uh, and we will organize uh, first a meeting for new members who want to, to know more about the network and how we potentially want to be implied. It, we, you are all um, overbooked, um, but, and we all are actually, but we, it's not much, it's just uh, one meeting every six weeks. We, we, tr we try to exchange, we have different topics, one can present their results, and we try to, to build collective actions. Um, if you want to join us, just here is the email, and we have a website actually on the PowerPoint. I didn't mention it, but we have a website, uh, medpoisonnetwork.com. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Christine. Thank you, Fred. Okay, it was an interesting round table uh, that. Uh, dealt with uh, an emerging issue, especially the restoration. So now I call my director, Mr. Khalil Ataya. We are coming to the end and uh, we need to, as we uh, announced it, uh, we need to uh, give the best uh, award for uh, the best uh, oral communication and best poster. But before, we would like uh, to thank, because the, the symposia was uh, backed by uh, great scientific members. And I would say, I would thank also, and uh, I will um, say the name, by alphabetic order, Mr. Ali Badradin, Mrs. Christine Perjon, Mr. Habib Langer, Mr. Ivan Guala, and Mrs. Monica Montefalconi. If they can join us, Monica, Ali, Christine. I don't know if uh, Ivan is here. Dora, if Dora, you are waiting for Dora. Yes, him. Sure. <laughs> I said that uh, this is a very uh, symbolic, simple uh, gift, just to remember, <laughs> to take it home and remember this nice but very interesting gathering. For me, I want a nice picture too. <laughs> Put it like this. <laughs> Thanks. Christine. So, 
So I I wanted just to thank you again for uh, your uh, bright work and for uh, your uh, engagement and very relevant work. <laughs> Without you, nothing would be <laughs> possible <laughs> at this quality. Thank you. <laughs> we have the gift of uh, Professor uh, Habib Langer, but uh, we will give it to his uh, wife, <laughs> who is here with us, <laughs> Sirin. Thank you. Ivan? If you want to say a word. <laughs> Thank you very much for involving me in this uh, nice uh, uh, adventure. I know that you work very hard, so. This is the least, at least something that uh, we can, with which we can recognize your uh, nice work. And the president, the president of the, the committee. Thank you very, so much for uh, your leadership. Thank you very much. Now we, I think we, we will have the uh, two uh, awards. awards for the best uh, oral presentation and best. Uh, yes. Uh, for the best oral communication, so the winner is uh, Daniele Ventura. So come on. <laughs> So you have a little uh, surprise beside the uh... <laughs> Yeah, look at this envelope. I won't say you what is it in it. <laughs> <laughs> Very modest, but, but uh, just uh, to encourage you to continue. Thank you so much. It's uh, an honor. <laughs> and we give you an appointment for the next uh, for okay. next um, symposium. I do that. <laughs> Thank you so much. The best poster. Yes, and the winner for the best uh, poster presentation is uh, Andrew Dalamo. Andrew. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, this will encourage you to continue and uh, push forward. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's a, it was an honor, and I really appreciate uh, the symposia and, and seeing all of you. <laughs> thank you. Good. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yes. Yeah. So now we will. Uh,
show you the uh, closing remark of the symposia. Yeah. So we have reached the end of this uh, interesting and uh, first uh, symposium. We listened to uh, several very interesting uh, uh, communications, uh, and I think that they all agree uh, in uh, outlining the current state uh, of seagrass uh, uh, and macroalgae, uh, marine vegetation, I would say, in the Mediterranean Sea. They all agree in uh, um, tracing the current dynamics and changes over time and in identifying some common strategies that uh, uh, should be developed in the years to come. So we uh, listed a number of uh, some conclusive remarks that we would like to share with all of you. First of all, Posidonia Midos, uh, are at the top, of course, of the ecosystems in terms of uh, carbon fixation and sequestration, especially in their mat. Considering the importance of the ecosystem services provided by Sigras Midov, as uh, we state, including carbon sequestration, a particular attention should be paid on their conservation and restoration. The scientific community has underlined the general regression, unfortunately, of the Posidonia uh, Midovs. Uh, mainly due to trolley, anchoring, and coastal development. Although some uh, local signs of natural recovery have been observed, especially where uh, effective protection measures have been uh, undertaken in the recent years. The same situation has been uh, observed also with uh, macroalgae. This evidence urgently asks for the need to strengthen effort uh, to further reinforce the protection of uh, key habitats by reducing pressure and by boosting the creation of MPAs and no-take zone, and to develop monitoring activities following the EMAP uh, guidance of the Barcelona Convention's ecosystem approach. Uh, and I would like to add also uh, promoting compliances among uh, different countries in the regulation, as uh, recently stated by uh, MPM. Mm, does uh, stricter and more binding measures are necessary for the protection of Posidonia oceanica meadows, especially against bottom trolling, anchoring uh, uh, through the improvement, for instance, of ecological moorings? All these measures should be considered in the update of the regional action plan on marine vegetation. We does need to reinforce the exchange of the best practices and to improve the mapping effort of Posidonia Mido at the world basin scale, also taking advantage from the availability of new investigated tools. For instance, the 3D mapping, photogrammetry, structure from motion, as we see in the communication of yesterday morning, high resolution remote sensing data, and so on. A particular attention should be paid to the southern part of the Mediterranean to reduce the gap that we still have uh, of knowledge and of monitoring activities between the northwestern parts and the southern Mediterranean countries. Local knowledge and historical data are really very important and should be considered a useful research tool for the monitoring of the dynamic of Posidonia meadows and in general of Sigras meadows. Historical data must thus be used as a baseline for assessing the status of this habitat at national, sub-regional and the regional level. Following, of course, the ecosystem approach roadmap decisions and in synergy with the regional directives and the regional sea conventions. The local variability and the specific ecological environment conditions that we stressed yesterday, such as hydrological conditions, should be taken into account during the implementation of the periodic assessment activities and during monitoring activities to understand, to better understand the resilience of habitats in a changing environment, with a particular attention to the key habitats listed in the reference list of benting habitats. Also, Posidonia oceanica banquettes have been shown to be 
of ecological importance for a healthy ecosystem and could be an asset for a sustainable tourism if we will we'll be able to raise people's awareness that banquets represent a strong sign of the Mediterranean identity. I like it a lot, <laughs> this, this sentence by Sal Consuel. Although our priority should always be conserved, to be conserved the existing natural habitats and ecosystem, an improvement in the protocol used in the restoration activities of both seagrass and macroalgae intervention is foreseen to facilitate and speed the recovery of the habitats. That's all. So thank you very much. Thank you. So, Mr. Kharil, the floor is yours to conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Art. Um, we touch the end of uh, this first uh, part of the uh, symposia series, and we have dealt with uh, we have dealt with the uh, uh, marine vegetation and particularly the uh, Posidonia, which is uh, the most uh, meaningful. Uh, as, um, species in terms of habitats in the Mediterranean. It's uh, sometimes the, the identity defined as the, the identity and the uh, emblematic habitats, habitat of uh, the Mediterranean. So I would like to commend the uh, quality of uh, interventions of the presentations, quality of uh, work preparation, and the uh, exchanges uh, among the, uh, uh, the, the, the audience and the uh, presenters and the, uh, the presidents of the sessions. It was a very nice and uh, uh, delivering uh, symposium. So thanks for everybody who has uh, made it uh, possible. Uh, my special, special thanks to the uh, efforts made to have uh, these uh, very clear and uh, brief uh, conclusions. Uh, I think that uh, these conclusions are uh, very important and they express the voice and opinion of the scientists in the Mediterranean and our uh, uh, responsibility as a, a regional uh, activity center in charge of biodiversity and especially protected areas under Barcelona Convention is to, to do our best to uh, um, uh, make these uh, conclusions and recommendations uh, reach the uh, contracting parties, the countries, uh, and we, we count on your help to give the uh, um, relevant arguments, scientifically based, and to uh, propose. We, we have uh, coming soon, uh, next year, our cycle of governance meetings starting by our focal point meeting in uh, uh, next May, 2023, uh, followed by the uh, MAP um, focal points uh, meeting, which uh, generally speaking uh, is held during September and in December, 2023, the conference of parties. So we count of, on you to uh, support us in conveying these uh, messages uh, very strongly, but very clear and uh, scientifically supported in order to, uh, to end up uh, out of the next uh, COP, COP23, I guess, of Barcelona Convention with uh, uh, improved decisions and measures and uh, more strictly uh, applied uh, uh, measures to protect uh, marine vegetation and particularly Posidonia. I just wanted to make a little sign to the uh, uh, Mediterranean Posidonia uh, uh, network 
and uh, to uh, assure you of our support and our uh, involvement as much as we uh, can. And uh, I hope that uh, this uh, network will, uh, will support all the scientists and the professionals also over the Mediterranean in order to, uh, to continue the, uh, the work and to have uh, visible results. So thank you all for uh, making this possible. And we declare this uh, symposium on marine uh, uh, vegetation closed. Thank you all. Thank you. We, we break for the coffee. Uh, we have 15 minutes. Be sharp uh, 20 to 11 to start the uh, next symposia concerning uh, coral lesions. So 15 minutes sharp, please. We have a lot of session and interesting presentation. Thank you.
ما يدي مشاب شيء So, can you see it? So we are going to start the uh, fourth Mediterranean symposia, symposium on the conservation of coral lesions and other calcareous bioconcretion. And uh, without further delay, I will give the floor to Mr. Khalil Ataya, the director of SPARAC, to give a few words for starting. Thank you. Thank you, Atif. Uh, you will have to support to, uh, to see my face uh, from time to time, but I promise <laughs> I won't be very long. So um, uh, we now sta uh, are starting the uh, second symposium which is on uh, uh, coralliginous and uh, other bioconcretions. Uh, I, I will switch to French in order to, uh, to make the balance for the uh, translators. Donc, uh, la, ce deuxième uh, symposium en back-to-back -back par rapport au premier, uh, il porte sur uh, euh, un habitat qui n'est pas moins important en Méditerranée que la végétation marine, qui a euh, encore des lacunes de point de vue connaissance euh, du, des, de la localisation des, de ces habitats, surtout, comme on le sait tous, dans les rive sud et euh, est de la Méditerranée. Donc, il euh, y a un grand effort de rattrapage des lacunes et j'espère, pour qu'on puisse faire des programmes cohérents et bien coordonnés au niveau de toute la mer Méditerranée, au niveau régional, sur la conservation de ces habitats qui sont très importants. Il y a aussi le problème de l'impact des changements climatiques et euh, de l'acidification de l'eau de mer sur les constructions coralligènes et calcaires en général. Donc, je suis sûr que ce forum va permettre de présenter parmi la communauté scientifique les derniers travaux et les derniers résultats les plus pertinents. Non et euh, qu'il va y avoir euh, des échanges et des discussions sur ces euh, euh, éléments d'information et ces euh, éléments d'évidence de terrain et autres. Donc, euh, je vous souhaite une, euh, de, de, de travaux vraiment euh, fructueux et je saisis l'occasion pour remercier euh, notre comité scientifique pour euh, le travail euh, important et euh, pertinent qui a été fait pour que ce symposium soit possible. Et je remercie aussi tous ceux qui et celles qui ont contribué à l'organisation 
pour qu'on soit tous ensemble ici pour euh, partager ces informations très importantes et discuter de cette euh, problématique au niveau euh, de la Méditerranée. Donc, euh, je vous remercie pour votre présence et pour vos contributions et je déclare ce symposium ouvert. Merci pour votre attention. Merci, Sergi. So the first session concerning mapping and characterization of coral regions habitat will be shared by Mr. Leonardo Tonesi and the reporter will be Mrs. Asma Yahya and my colleague. Thank you. Thank you, Hatef. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Let us start the symposium with the first communication. And then um, the, the title of this first communication is Core MedNet, Building a Database on the Distribution, Demography, and Conservation Status of Cessile Species for Mediterranean Coraligenous Assemblages. Please, uh, Christina Linares, you have the floor. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you to be here. I will present this initiative from our research group, the Metro Cover. Um, this is uh, well, this is a brief communication because we the, the aim of this presentation is to show our work in this uh, in this um, database. So this is CormenNet. Yeah, it's not showing here. Oh, okay, I show. I see here, but you don't. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so this is CormenNet. Uh, why we are working in this initiative is we, because we will see here during this session that we have a lot of information about coraligenous assemblages. Uh, we, uh, we are a lot of people working on the same topic, so we are increasing the knowledge uh, on coraligenous community, but uh, we think that in general, no, in general, there are some few exceptions, but all this information is scattered, it is dispersed. So the, the, um, our aim in this CormenNet online database is to compile data on geographic and depth distribution, demography and mortality of different coraligenous habitat forming species. You will see that we have started by some few groups, but the intention is to grow, to grow together. So to final, uh, the, the final aim is to guide management strategies to enhance the conservation of coraligenous assemblages across the, inter and the entire Mediterranean Sea. You see here the, the, the web page. This is, as, as I explained to you, this is, is on the website. Um, and you can see all the data that we have uh, uploaded at the moment. So there is information that we share with all of you. And at the moment, um, we started by this distribution, demography and conservation, basically. Uh, this is where we, we will not enter in these details, but basically we, we compile data about distribution information, demographic information, about the different studies that we have uh, found in the literature and the technical reports. The problem, as, as we have we, we, we have always, is the, um, well, the, that, the data set now is included more than 4,000 records from more than 200 species covering all Mediterranean ecoregions. But you, you can see another time, no? when you, we put the, ma the maps, all, always we see this, uh, this strong bias towards the north, 
but basically the northwestern Mediterranean. So we ask you, we want to upload and, and we need more data in, in these regions. Uh, about taxonomic groups, what we have in the database. Basically, most, the most available information is about three major taxonomic groups in order of importance are Nidarian, basically Anthozoans, Octocorals, Porifera, and Bryozoans. And you can see again, no, the, um, the, the, the information is concentrated on the Northwestern Mediterranean Sea, but we have information across the Mediterranean, but with few records in, in, in different regions. And if we see the type of studies and information that, that provided by the different studies, basically we have data about the position, not the distribution, but also the density. After that, the size of colonies or the size structure of the populations, and also, um, but in, in, in less occurrence, about mortality status. So you, you see again no, the map on the Northwestern Mediterranean uh, concentrate most of the information. Another important thing is that basically we are covered at the temporal coverage, uh, the, the, the temporal. Um, the temporal trend, the temporal scale that we have covered is until 2020. We are working now in update the, the, the database. So this is a continuous update of the database and basically it's concentrated from the 90s. So you can see that most of the studies was from 90s to, 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 to actually. What we can do with this type of, of database, no? that it's open to all of you. Uh, we check basically the distribution of the species, the knowledge that we have, but also, for example, we ask for the patterns of bathymetrical distribution. We can see here, this is uh, the, 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 um, the large graph is for all the species together. The small graphs is for the different species. But what you can see here is the upper depth distribution is the, is 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 um, is deepening along the longitude. So it's one of the things that we know. But probably sometimes we lack of data to show this or what we happen with other species that we don't know very well with in comparison with others. Another. Another demographic information that, that we found that it's interesting is this relation between size and density, because in the database you have all the parameters and you can check and you can check all the correlations that you are interested on. For example, I put here this relationship between height and density. So basically we found that the populations with high density have, have um, smaller colonies that we thought, and it's it, we have to check if this, this is valid for all the species in the Coralusionus, but it's one of the things that we can explore. We, we also can explore the size structure on the different sites, on the different locations. This is the different colors of the different species. For example, the purple is the Paramorithia clavata. The, the red one is the, um, is the Coralium rubrum. The green is the Unicella cavolini and the blue is the Onicella singularis and the different regions that we have data. So we can check the size distribution across the across Mediterranean basin and see if the different locations have different size structure or different or, or different population structures across regions, across species. Another thing that we can check, no, it's that that, but this is linked with a presentation that that Kim will do tomorrow. Kim Garabo will do tomorrow. It's about the conservation status. We have also data about the percentage of colonies affected. This will be presented by 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 Kim. But for example, from this uh, from this database, we can see that we we have a gradient from Western to Eastern Mediterranean Sea, where in the Western Mediterranean Sea we have a severe severe moderate impact of these mortalities that are occurring actually in these days related to marine heat waves, for example. But at the moment, with low data, we have uh, a better conservation status of the different species in the, in, the, in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. So we can do a lot of things and we can explore a lot of things, but we need more data Basically, in a species that we don't know, we have a lot of data in Paramoricea clavata, we have a lot of data in Coralium rubrum, we have a lot of data in Eunicella, but we have 
uh, few, few data on sponges, on bryozoans, and other, other organisms in the coral region. And so we, it could be interesting to have all the information together here. Obviously, we have detected uh, gaps of knowledge that we know, but we can see again that it's this this geographic uh, ge uh, the, this lack of data from from the southern east Mediterranean coast. Also, we lack of data of deeper populations. Most of the information and records that we have is from shallower up to 50 meters, but we know that Coralligenus is, is reaching uh, deeper waters and probably it's really interesting. This, it's, they are more interesting now. So we need to know more about this. We need uh, data about other species that we have not data in now in the um, in the database and we need more data about other demographic parameters so we basically we think that this is a unique unique opportunity to build a regional map of distribution and conservation status of coralligen species uh, this is CORMED-NET have working from our group to be a collaborative database to, prom to promote a continuous update. You can update the, the data, but you can send us also um, technical reports that you have and we can enter the data. So it's open to all people to collaborate. Uh, in this sense, we expect that researcher, manager, managers of marine protected areas, technical staff and others or citizen science, citizens and scientists contribute with non-publication information. So all the information is welcome. And uh, of course, CormetNet can be benefited also from including the information gathered on other citizen science actions such Observadores del Mar, Sea Watchers from Barcelona, but Rip Check from Italy and other initiatives. So I think it's a, a good place to put all together because the information will be, able, will be available for all together. What is the future directions? upload more data on the on the gaps that we have uh, today, but we want to also to include um, data on genetics, we are working on this, on the, on the information about the genetics of the species that we have. But also we want, uh, we have in the, in our research group, we, we have working in the trait based approach, uh, working on the, these traits, species traits in coralliginous species. I show you a graph of, 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 um, of a paper of Daniel Gomez Graz last year that working in this team, but the, the final goal is to have something similar, not so ambitious, but something similar that the people from coral trait database from coral reefs have. So the idea is to work to build up step by step this initiative. And we invite all you to participate and it's open to all the people to ask us or to, to, to participate whether what, what the information that they have. So as I think, well, thank you for your attention. This is um, the main group of working on this initiative, but there are many others. And thank you for Thank you, Christine, Christina, uh, for the presentation uh, of this relevant uh, tool, in fact, uh, to assume important information on the present scale. And then we have the time for one uh, questions from the floor. Any question on, on this topic? Please. It's really clear. <laughs> yes, I think that it's very important the information to know that the, um, this group, this important group, prepared, realized this tool, and then is up. It's all of us must uh, contribute for these uh, important uh, to obtain these important results. And then, Christina, thank you very much. Thank you so much. And we. Can, we have um, a question from online participants. We can move to the second presentation, uh, bridging together research and technological innovation. First the results and expected, uh, expected bearings of the project Cresci Blue Reef on Mediterranean Coralligenus. The presentation will be done by Antonietta Rosso online. And then... Yes, I'm, I am here. Thank you very much, Leonardo, for uh, 
this presentation. I am uh, starting with the, the condivision of the. Uh, do you uh, do you see my presentation? No. No, actually we. We see <laughs> you see yes, me. Yes. Okay. Now yes. Okay. Uh, I can go to. Okay. Okay. And uh, so I am uh, presenting you um, some preliminary results and the state of our um, project on the Coraligenus. And uh, um, uh, we also experienced and uh, see uh, some of the uh, gaps of knowledge that uh, have been uh, um, remarked by my previous, uh, uh, the previous speaker. Uh, the project uh, is uh, Crashy Blue Reef and is intended to explore the components, growth rate and accretion style of the Mediterranean coraligenous bioconstructions and also to um, develop a experiment, an experimental tool to uh, minimize the impact of uh, sampling uh, above all on the um, growth um, concretion. So uh, we are uh, developing a, a small um, engine uh, to be used to core a small portion of the concretions uh, and not uh, all the concretions as it is um, uh, done until now. Uh, as you all know, Coraligenus is a very important relevant habitat in the Mediterranean and it is constructed by several animals, but uh, as uh, we can, um, uh, as uh, we uh, understand from previous communication, the, uh, there are a lot of uh, gaps of knowledge and mostly the knowledge is uh, um, uh, biased towards uh, some groups and some depths, but we know that uh, coraligenous can have uh, several kind of uh, aspects and can be um, developed down to about 100 meters. We also saw that the interest on coraligenous habitat is increasing uh, above all after the uh, 20. Zero, zero. So uh, we have a lot of scientific papers, but mostly uh, they uh, focus on the canopy that cover the concretions or on the erect species that colonize directly the um, rocks. Uh, so uh, we uh, need uh, more knowledge about the concretion itself that is made by organisms that uh, grow uh, on each other and uh, have uh, uh, skeletons that can uh, um, over, uh, overlap uh, and uh, um, accretion uh, is formed during time, uh, usually very slowly, but we have uh, um, few knowledge also about this. In order to minimize the sampling impact, we also are developing with the colleagues from the University of uh, um, Calabria uh, an engine uh, similar to those uh, actually uh, and uh, presently um, uh, used by archaeologists to clean um, underwater uh, heritage um, heritage um, remains. And uh, uh, the area on which we concentrate uh, and we focus is off Marzamemi. So we are in southeast Sicily, and the ba uh, bathymetry is from about 30 meters to about 100 meters. The Coraligenus uh, is present in this uh, area, and it was already known. We saw also a small dot in the uh, charts, in the maps um, presented by previous speaker and uh, uh, in this area we have some images of the bottom we have uh, um, discrete uh, build-ups uh, that uh, um, emerge from the um, sedimentary bottom and some papers have been already done in 20 some 20 or 10 years ago one presented at the Raxpa of uh, Tabarca and uh, uh, we are 
we started about one year ago and uh, we investigated some uh, an area that is uh, extensive from about 20 meters to about uh, 100 meters um, these are the analysis we already done a collection of videos and backscattering bathymetry and so on and uh, further analysis are planned for the future and on the right we have a lot of uh, poster and oral communications that have been produced during this year and the preliminary preliminary uh, first uh, results already published or in uh, in press and um, uh, I will uh, give you some uh, information about all this. So starting from the bathymetry acquisition, we have now a um, detailed map of uh, the geomorphology of the bottom with the um, small size uh, um, elevations and depressions of the bottom. We have a sedimentary map and uh, showing also the presence of the buildups that can be uh, scattered or can be grouped, uh, sometimes densely grouped, to form this kind of situation. This is a, a shallow water, uh, that means about 35 meters depth situation where the canopy is completely formed by uh, soft algae um, and uh, interspersed we have also some uh, posidonia uh, plants and uh, uh, the buildups can be um, densely spaced or dispersed sparse columns so that elevate from this bottom some uh, um, 50 to uh, 50 centimeter to about 80 or uh, one meter. Uh, we collect the two uh, buildups, one from the uh, area where uh, density was um, uh, high and uh, one from uh, an area where the um, columns were dispersed and uh, uh, some analysis were focused to look at the constructor who uh, do uh, the construction and the construction is uh, mm, made by crustose corellin algae that play the major role uh, both on the surface and also inside the structure of the bioconstruction uh, whereas animal uh, organisms are in this case very subordinate uh, when we um, detach all the algal uh, the algae uh, that form the canopy the situation is this so Coralina uh, algae are the predominant um, constructor uh, together with the Pesson Eliacians. Uh, for the first time, uh, we also um, conduct, um, measured uh, the porosity of these structures that is uh, relatively high, and pores are often um, filled with sediment that accumulates from the uh, water column and the, from the surrounding uh, um, areas, but also uh, includes uh, remains of the organisms that live on the, uh, by the, on the build up itself. We also focus on uh, the role that uh, different organisms play on the constructions, uh, um, uh, but also uh, looking at the secondary constructions, at uh, mm, dwellers that live on the surface in cavities and also on the canopy. Uh, focusing on the sediment, it is very important and relevant uh, to consider also the impact and the role that uh, microorganisms can do inside the, the cavities and, uh, and um, uh, with the uh, um, decaying processes uh, of uh, um, porifera, for instance, that uh, can be uh, included in the fissure or in the crevices uh, inside the structures and uh, whose uh, activity can lead also to uh, early litification processes that are very important and relevant for the conservation and the preservation, the strengthening and the preservation of the structure. We also focus on these sediments to look uh, there at their origin, and uh, we saw that there are 
sediments that are um, very fine and uh, include the sponge spiculas inside and are bright uh, green when treated with epifluorescence uh, light, denoting the presence of uh, high content of organic matter. And this can be very interesting to understand the uh, early litification processes. Uh, within sediments, also uh, nanoplankton uh, um, uh, parts can be preserved and they can be um, um, in part uh, transported from uh, nearby uh, areas after the decaying the, the of uh, um, pre-existing rocks, but some are directly from the water column. And this can be very relevant and important to um, have to help with the in, in interpretation of the growth uh, and the growth uh, velocity of uh, uh, the um, structure together with dating of the um, concretion, the algal concretion. Uh, we also focus on, focused on the cover and the canopy and the diverse, diversity associated with the canopy. This is one of um, the buildup of the two buildup we collected from um, about 36 meters and uh, uh, we can see there is a um, cover made by algae but also by a bryozoan this uh, branched one and we focused on the biodiversity associated present on this uh, canopy and you can see uh, the uh, a table illustrating the diversity, so with a lot of species. And you can see the poster focusing on this. I invite you to visit it and to follow Gemma Donato, who will illustrate it together with Francesco Dalpa. Uh, on this same uh, build-up, we have, as I uh, already said, told you, uh, after algae, Flabella peziolata, for instance, Bessonelia rubra or Mundaria volubilis, we have also the Bryozoan margaretta cereoides, that is an erect species uh, that grows up to six, uh, seven, eight centimeter high in the present sample. And uh, this is um, an example of the diversity associated. And you can see that this species of bryozoan is very uh, host, a uh, high diversity um, of uh, um, in comparison to other ones and in comparison to the total. And this presumably points to the possibility that Margaretta cereoides promote biodiversity on this correligionous buildup, probably because uh, the uh, surface it offers is more durable and consistent in respect to soft algae that are, mm, uh, can decay rapidly. Uh, Within the uh, biodiversity, we also focused on a particular species uh, that is a bivalve, a small sized bivalve, few, um, one, two millimeters long, Gregariella semigranata, that uh, is uh, a particular one because it is uh, able to live inside the crevices. So um, only the posterior side of the shell and the um, uh, mantle uh, go up and can be visible, but is uh, shaped as a, a, an algae, as you can see. So it is a very strange uh, um, adapt, um, adaptation to um, cope with the predation probably. And uh, um, this species was very abundant. Uh, instead, it is uh, known as a um, subordinate species, very rare probably because it is very small and can be easily overlooked. And also this gives some measure of the gaps of knowledge we have uh, if we don't look carefully to all components. Uh, finally, 
we also focused on microfauna associated to the coralligenous. These groups are usually uh, very few um, investigate, um, have very few investigations, particularly ostracods. And probably this is the first time we um, somebody looks at ostracods from the coralligenous in detail. And uh, in literature, Lobier um, cited uh, more than 10 species, but that were unidentified. And uh, uh, in this case, we have about uh, 20 species, uh, all lie, uh, with the, present with the live uh, individuals. So we reach the diversity of this group uh, very um, sensitive. Uh, also, foraminifers are very abundant. Uh, we have uh, 130 species, but uh, mixing together live and dead specimens. We have now to um, separate them, and uh, the number uh, is uh, uh, in excess, uh, doubles the number already known before. Uh, so I um, thank you for your attention, for this uh, uh, first uh, uh, overview of uh, uh, the um, results obtained in the first year. And the uh, uh, next results will be surely um, uh, available uh, in the next, uh, next year when uh, we have uh, uh, two um, sections on coralligenous uh, and bioconcretions in general uh, in uh, a meeting, uh, the uh, meeting of INQUA in Rome. Thank you. And uh, if you have a question, I am here for curiosity. Thank you, Antonietta, for the presentation of the first, first uh, but very deep uh, results uh, on, on this topic, on this project. And uh, we have uh, the time just for a, a question because uh, it was uh, very detailed in your presentation. <laughs> I don't know if there are um, one question, question on, on this topic uh, from the floor. both uh, regarding technical aspects and uh, or um, on the number of species or the different um, taxa studied uh, in this project. If not, in fact, we will have uh, after uh, at the closure of this, uh, this uh, group of presentation, a general discussion, then we can go deep uh, also in this aspect. And then thank you uh, again, Antonietta. We can move uh, to the following presentation, um, um, the state of knowledge on the deep coralliginous rings of Cape Corsica following the scientific expedition Gombessa 6, 6 uh, 2021. Please, uh, Julie Deter, you have the floor. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Bonjour à tous, donc euh, Julie Deterre et moi-même, Jean-Laurent Masset du Parc naturel Morel de Cap-Corse, on va vous présenter euh, l'état de connaissance sur les anneaux de coralligène euh, du Cap-Corse suite à, à l'expédition euh, gombe sassis menée en 2021. Donc rapidement, avant de rentrer dans, dans, le, sujet, euh, dans le sujet des anneaux, euh, je vais juste vous présenter succinctement le parc naturel marin du, du Cap-Corse et de l'agréable dans lequel c'est s'est déroulée cette expédition. Donc, le parc il a été créé en 2016, donc c'est un parc tout jeune. C'est le plus grand de France métropolitaine avec 6830 km. Il y a une forte extension au large avec une grande partie en zone économique exclusive au-delà de la mer territoriale, avec 225 km de côte, 27 communes pour seulement 18 000 habitants, avec une augmentation de la population en été 
notamment lié à, à la saison touristique. Euh, donc pour, euh, pour gérer ce parc, ben, il a fallu élaborer un plan de gestion. Alors le plan de gestion, il a été élaboré par le conseil de gestion. Rapidement, le conseil de gestion, c'est en gros le Parlement de la mer, hein, une sorte de conseil d'administration du parc et qui gère le parc, qui prend les décisions. Et donc le plan de gestion qu'on a élaboré avec l'équipe du parc, donc il prend en compte neuf enjeux, hein, la qualité de l'eau, les espèces, euh, la lieutique, les écosystèmes avec les habitats. Les activités socio-économiques, le patrimoine culturel, le changement climatique, la gouvernance et la sensibilisation. Donc voilà, tout ça pour vous montrer que le parc naturel marin, c'est un type d'air marine protégé qui, euh, qui englobe de nombreuses thématiques et de nombreux enjeux. Et, euh, et donc, juste pour terminer, le, un parc naturel marin, il repose sur trois objectifs euh, l'acquisition de connaissances sur, sur l'environnement marin, la protection et la gestion et le développement durable et la sensibilisation. Et donc, tout ça, en fait, c'est compris dans le projet Gombessa. Le projet Gombessa, via l'acquisition de données, etc., va nous permettre de pouvoir protéger, de pouvoir gérer, de prendre des décisions et de sensibiliser, euh, de sensibiliser sur ces habitats particuliers que va, que va vous présenter euh, Julie à présent. So uh, the objective was to better know the coralligenous rings that were described 10 years ago. So the, we wanted to complete the existing uh, map and then uh, better characterize the coralligenous rings in their dynamics. In fact, these are these are uh, coralligenous, uh, uh, sorry, uh, rhodolith rings with a coralligenous uh, central core. And for uh, this characterization, we implemented three core samples. We measured para environmental parameters, hydrodynamics, and we built 3D models. Uh, there was also a fauna and flora inventory with spaces, sediment, acoustic, water, and pictures and videos. And uh, we wanted to quantify the threats to this ecosystem. This, uh, this method was uh, done by uh, four divers. Um, it was, uh, in fact, uh, uh, autonomous uh, saturation diving. So four divers were uh, in a sort of elevator, which can go up and down. And uh, these divers lived in a basal station, a pressurized basal station, which uh, was on the surface. This basal station was on a barge and it was tug by a tugboat uh, on, the, on the sea. So for the results, um, um, almost uh, 700 hectares were mapped and uh, um, 1,417 rings were counted. Uh, 500 were uh, within the park. Uh, some of these rings have uh, presented a central core and some uh, no, not, uh, no core and some were unknown because we, we can't uh, dive on all the, the rings. You can see here on the map uh, where the rings are between, uh, some are in French waters, some are between French and Italian waters. The rings were between 90 and uh, 135 meter depths but mainly between 110 and 120. And in fact, they were uh, mainly present between faults and uh, next to a fossil coastline presenting an alignment of large underwater caves uh, at uh, 94 meters. Um, so we, we performed saturation dive, nine dive, in fact, between 94 and 120 meters. It was in uh, July uh, 2021 for a total exploration time of 128 hours. All the planned protocols were implemented, so the divers were very efficient. And the three cores were sampled. You, you can see here. Here you can see a central core with a big uh, gorgonian, Calugorgia uh, verticillata and the divers and the elevator also. Two temperate sensors were installed and uh, environmental data uh, were measured with a multi-parametric sensor. The temperature, for example, was uh, 24 degrees at the surface and 14 uh, at, at the seabed. All these data uh, have been published and you can uh, access them if you want in uh, Sinoe. 
the current speed was between 20 and 30 meters per second, and no significant vertical effusion was measured, so no gas or no uh, water. Uh, we were able to compare uh, a course that was uh, modeled in uh, 2014 and uh, a course that we modeled. And we can see that uh, crevices and sedimentation have increased and uh, there was no change for big spaces cover. Three other rings that were modeled in, uh, in uh, 3D, 3D by photogrammetry. And uh, in fact, we can observe that uh, the rings were domes with a 36 centimeter uh, high and overhung by a central core uh, of uh, 67 uh, centimeter high in mean. Uh, I think I don't have the time for the 3D model, but you can see here a central core with a uh, Calogorgia uh, verticillata. For the biodiversity uh, by e environmental DNA, uh, we sampled sediment on the core within the halo in the crown and outside the ring, but uh, sorry, I don't have any results now because analysis are still in progress because we have many, many sequences. Water sample um, for fish biodiversity showed that we had 50 species uh, on these sites. Uh, all the indicators value uh, are weak, except uh, on the site 17, where the specific and functional riches, richness are mean and not weak. And another site where thermic uh, indices in index is uh, quite high. Octocorals uh, samples were used for will be used for population genetics next year, and uh, they were used for phylosymbiosis uh, study between bacteria, uh, microbiota, and octocorals. What we can see in uh, yellow is uh, there is a distinct microbiome for Calcaxonia, Cal Calogorgia verticillata, and in blue, a separate cluster, so a coevolution for um, Olaxonia, which are Unicella varicosa, Unicella cavolini, and uh, Paramoricea. Uh, the divers very frequently observed uh, the large nudie branch uh, Tritonia calogorgiae, which was uh, very recently described and uh, that it was believed to be quite rare. So finally, it's not so, so rare. And uh, finally, for the pressure, two hydrophones show that uh, there was a high noise pollution on uh, this ecosystem because of uh, maritime traffic. This uh, noise, noise pollution was higher than uh, what we know on coastal habitats. Numerous active cetaceans, uh, especially sperm, sperm whales and delphinidae. Uh, low diversity of biological sounds, but some sounds are rare and some other are unknown. And the acoustic biodiversity in rings is totally different from what we know uh, on coastal carolegenous reefs. The high maritime traffic was confirmed using AIS and numerous fishing nets were observed by the diver, like you can see here, a net on the central core. And to conclude. Du coup, pour conclure, euh, voilà, pour rappeler rapidement les, les, les résultats présentés par Julie, voilà, il y a beaucoup d'anneaux qui ont été découverts euh, au cours de différentes campagnes et qui ont été, euh, qui ont été identifiés euh, grâce à cette nouvelle campagne Bombessa. Euh, 1417 anneaux euh, entre 90 mètres et 130 mètres de profondeur. Euh, avec ensuite voilà, de nombreuses grottes euh, sur un littoral fossile de plus de 5 km de, de long euh, qui ont été également identifiées. Une importante biodiversité, également des pressions, des pressions que nous, gestionnaires, on doit connaître justement pour proposer des, des différentes mesures. Donc, ce qui est important pour nous aujourd'hui, c'est de, voilà, de se poser la question sur la continuité. Euh, on voit que les anneaux sont situés euh, au sein des eaux françaises, italiennes et entre les eaux françaises et italiennes, justement, au niveau des eaux internationales. Et euh, voilà, nous, l'idée aujourd'hui, en tant que gestionnaire, c'est de se poser la question sur l'avenir et de proposer, euh, voilà, d'entamer de, des discussions pour, euh, pour échanger sur une idée de, de protection internationale euh, avec la France et l'Italie, justement pour protéger ces biocénoses. 
Donc, euh, donc voilà pourquoi le projet Gombessa aussi a été, a été mené et, euh, et se poursuit jusqu'en 2023 avec une nouvelle campagne l'année prochaine euh, qui nous apportera davantage sur, euh, sur euh, la biodiversité de ces écosystèmes, notamment leur, euh, leur euh, origine. Donc voilà pour conclure, euh, pour conclure avec euh, l'ensemble des partenaires qui ont participé à ce projet. Euh, donc voilà, merci, merci à tous. Merci pour cette présentation vraiment très intéressante et euh, il faut considérer aussi du côté italien qu'on est en train de démarrer un système pour la protection de sites au-delà au des 12 milles de la, de la côte et en particulier en prenant en considération les aspects liés à la, à la directive euh, Habitat. Et, et ça pourra rentrer, je crois, dans l'aspect la, des habitats euh, 1100 70. Et de ce point de vue-là, je crois qu'on pourrait échanger pour définir quelques solutions en commune. Dans le passé, avec une campagne Ramoge dans le 2018, euh, on a étudié pour des zones profondes et le Spinolaspur, que c'était un système de rocha qui, se, qui est juste dans les eaux de transition entre l'Italie et la Corse. Et de cette raison, sur, sur ce site, on est en train de penser de faire quelque chose comme l'Italie, de faire un site de Natura 2000 et on pourra voir s'il tombe dans les, les, le périmètre de, ce, de, 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 de votre nouvelle aire marine protégée du Parc national. Et ensuite, je crois que aussi sur de ce, de cette façade, c'est vraiment important de l'échanger aussi d'une façon officielle, de façon de pouvoir avoir les éléments pour démarrer les choses de façon efficace. Ensuite, merci. Et ensuite, je ne sais pas s'il y a des autres questions, on peut avoir la possibilité pour des demandes. S'il vous plaît, vous avez la parole. Yeah. Okay. You have told a little about details what lives on the uh, these uh, constructions. By the way, they are called microatols in the literature. And but you didn't answer one fundamental question: What is the origin and what is the age of this construction? My impression is that they are not living extant forms; that these coralligenous microatols are just drone forms that originated uh, close to the sea level surface. They are quite well known all over the world, uh, from especially in the Caribbean, Bermuda, uh, in uh, uh, Brazilian Atlantic reefs, and they are called microatolls. Usually they form at this level. And what suggests more that your forms are uh, uh, dead formations, those that were drowned, because they are associated with ancient coastal uh, uh, zones, and the age of it, it fits, uh, no, the depth of it fits more or less uh, the uh, sea level change between the uh, glacial time and today. Around 100 meters, that's what, what's the difference between uh, present day level Uh, sea level in the Mediterranean and during the glacial time. So my suggestion is to look more at the construction itself, not only, uh, not only at what lives with this. And I'm sorry, this undermines a little your conclusion that is absolutely unique in the world, because I think they are drowned and this is unique, but usually they form and they are well known uh, today all over the world, these microatolls. Thank you. Yeah, we, we work uh, with a geologist, so uh, yes, the, the question is the age, you, 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 I agree with you, and, uh, but we are waiting for these results, so I, I don't know. Rendez-vous uh, yes. next year. Yes I, yes, I think that this is an opportunity just to, to exchange and increase the information also, but for the Mediterranean, not a longer world, but it's for sure an important uh, uh, discovery. Uh, please, uh, uh, Atef, there is a, for an ask, that you have the floor, please. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation uh, regarding to the cause of this uh, project. 
you don't mention to the statistical analysis that have used also the by diverse indicators and for the population genetics which gene that you have used for these the four different species thank you uh, sorry i uh, i didn't understand because uh, there is many voices could, could you repeat Regarding to your goals that you have to study the uh, inventory for flora and fauna. For your presentation, don't mention to the uh, statistical analysis that have used. Also for the biodiversity indicators to compare between the species. Also for the genetic populations, which gene that have used for different species to compare between the populations. For uh, eDNA, you, you speak about eDNA or uh, everything. Uh, we have um, um, we have many indices for uh, for fish. We have uh, indices based on uh, life history traits. Uh, on uh, phylogenetics, on uh, so on genetics, and um, uh, yeah, simple also richness, biodiversity richness. Uh, for the sounds, uh, that uh, an analysis uh, on the sounds. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we we have to focus on each the method. It's too long. Sorry to to explain uh, here, but uh, we can discuss uh, about it if you want. But uh, it's totally different uh, depending on the method. Sorry. Okay, thank you. And there is another question online from a, a person connected. And then you have uh, you connected uh, online. You have the floor, please. Antonietta Rossi. Uh, uh, yes, yes uh, thank you. But my question uh, or my comments were uh, um, uh, already uh, uh, the, the, the person uh, speaking before me, uh, um, the person speaking before me uh, made the same comments or something similar comments to mine. So I can pass. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Antonietta. And then we can move to the last. Ah, there is another question, please. Hi, and did you see any black corals during the monitoring besides Gorgonians such as Calogorgia or Paramorici and so on? So, I mean, Antipatella or species like this? Uh, no, no black corals. Okay, thank you. It's, it's a mix between uh, uh, very deep spaces that uh, sometimes we can see in canyons and uh, some gorgonians that you can find uh, uh, shallower. Okay, thank you. Yes, probably just coming back to the, this topic, it could be very important to, to, to analyze the contents of uh, the composition of the species creating these biogenic uh, rocks. No, to identify, to evaluate uh, the role of the rhodolites. And then, because this could be, should be also a, a coraliginous of platform, no, created by the aggregation of rhodolites. And this could be interesting to, to have some, some analysis of the samples of the contents of the structure to see if the hypothesis is uh, uh, from uh, the different level of the Mediterranean uh, through the glacial uh, periods or uh, created by like uh, an example of atolls coming from the creation of uh, a coralligious platform. But this is, I think, very important your presentation just to, st to start, to continue to, uh, to study this topic. Okay, thank you very much because we are, we are a little bit out of time and then we can move to the next uh, and last presentation before the lunch. Um, the evaluation of the ecological status of the Mermetis Reef along the Lebanese coasts, Eastern Mediterranean Sea by Ali Badreddin. Please, Ali. 
You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Hello, everyone. So I will break a little bit the mood of correlations assemblages. I will present the result of a study done along the Lebanese coast on the evaluation of vermity drifts, one of the most important coastal ecosystems in the Mediterranean Sea, including the Lebanese coast. So, in the Mediterranean Sea, vermitid reefs are formed by a mollusca gastropod, Dendropoma and related genera, associated with another mollusk, Vermitus tricotrus, and a coralline alga, Neogoniolitum brassica florida. They are present in many localities of the Mediterranean Sea, where the largest one can be found in the Eastern Mediterranean. So, including the Lebanese coast, Palestinian and Syrian coast. And the recent genetical studies done by Pompedo in 2016 uh, find that for every region, a particular species of Dendropoma. So for the most Western Mediterranean, it has been attributed Dendropoma libeci as the, reef, the main reef builder. Uh, for the Tyrrhenian and Ligurian Sea, it was Dendropoma cristatum. For the Aeonian and Aegean Sea, the Dendropoma was undescribed. However, for the Eastern Mediterranean, it was Dendropoma anguilliferum as endemic for this region. The Mediterranean vermitid reef have provided many function, many ecosystem function and services, including the most important that they are refuge and habitat and nursery for many species assemblages, including invertebrates and fish. Also, they are paleobatymetric marker. Also, they are potential, let's say, bioindicator of climate change, since concerning the rising sea and the change in the surface of the water. And they protect the coast from wave erosion. And one important thing of vermitid reefs, they are also a support of other Mediterranean key marine species, including canopy forming brown algae, cystosera, for example. And here I will present something from Lebanon. Uh, during our field work, I found that some birds come and take the sand, humid sand from the vermitid reef to, to build their habitat. This is something to add to the vermitid reef as they are, they are giving a lot of services for other also terrestrial species. However, vermitid, vermitid reefs are under a mix of natural and human pressure including acidification, sea warming, human pressure, including coastal development, also urbanization. And also they are impacted by invasive species. They are also impacted by invasive species, like for example, the invasive uh, gastro bivalve, gast uh, bivalve Brachydontes pharaonis, especially in the Levantan Sea. So a typical vermitid reefs in Lebanon. It, vermitid reefs in Lebanon are formed by Dendropoma anguilliferum associated with Vermitus ricutrus and Neogoniolitum brassica florida. Moving seawards, the vermitid reefs are divided into three morphological zones. The outer edge, here we can find the Dendropoma anguilliferum as a burole, and the inner edge where we can find the Vermitus ricutrus. And also we have the cuvette, that means the tidal pool, also what we call it the enclave, because they regroup a faunal flora uh, attributed or associated to the infralitoral zone. Also concerning the level, if we want to talk, want to talk about the level. So for example, supralitoral, we can find like some characteristic species uh, associated with this level. Uh, they can resist the temperature and salinity like some littorine and also other isopod. Uh, for the superior medio littoral, we can find like some tamals. And for the inferior medio littoral, here we can find this vermitid reef. If in the occidental, the position of the vermitid reef is uh, the infra littoral, in the eastern Mediterranean is medio littoral. So, how the Lebanese vermitid reef was monitored. We use like the two non-destructive methods, uh, the transect one, it called it the, the point, uh, point intercept one, 
and the photo quadrats. Uh, in fact, uh, we did like uh, five transects for each zone of the vermity drift, so five in the inner edge and five in the outer edge. And also for the photo quadrat, we did the same thing. And also for the software, we use the imagery to evaluate and assess the vermity, so the, quanti the quantity, the density, the abundance. The monitored site. So we choose like 10 sites along the Lebanese coast from the south to the north. And these sites are, let's say, uh, what, so we have like impacted site, uh, we have not impacted site, we have reference area, and also we have moderately impacted site. So uh, the, the level of impacted, uh, the level of pressure was defined by application of the Luzi index. The Luzi index is a, is a uh, mantis of activity pressure. It takes in consideration like uh, many pressure, including agriculture, uh, fishing, uh, human disturbance. Uh, also, they are giving like some codes. And according to this code, we have give a score for a cost. So, and uh, this is how we show this, uh, of course, this uh, site. And of course, they are characterized by the presence of a large vermity drift. For the results concerning uh, the photo quadrats, here we can find that uh, Dendropoma and Guliferum are only present in the not impacted site and also in the moderately impacted site, but near the MPA. And for the maximum, it's like 25 individual by uh, centimeter squared, it means the density. And concerning the, let's say, the dead uh, Dendropoma angliferum density, uh, it was found in all the, in all the sites. This is normal. Uh, but the, the number of uh, dead living uh, Dendropoma angliferum are also high in the impacted and moderately impacted. Because it's not impacted, we can find eroded vermity drifts. However, for the vermitous trees that can persist a little bit, uh, let's say, the pollution, uh, it was found like uh, in all the not impacted and moderately impacted site. And for the not impacted site, we didn't find any vermitous trees living, I think, here. And also for the coverage, it was in agreement with our result of photo quadrat, since we can see that Dendropoma anguliferum was very occurring uh, in the not impacted site. However, vermitus ricotrus was also occurring in the not impacted and moderately impacted site. So what is the situation in other Levantine countries? So here I make a little bit comparison to say, for example, in Crete and Cyprus, uh, the percentage was like 15 and 55% of vermitids. In, uh, along the Palestinian coast, there is an extension. So it was a regional extension of Dendropoma and Guliferum. In Lebanon in 2019, the number of individual was like around three. Now in this study, it's like going up to like say 35. So this is so important that this species is in uh, under a rehabilitation, especially in this region where Dendropoma and Guliferum is under a regional extension. But until if you do a small comparison with other Mediterranean country, we can found that in this study, we found like 140 individuals of living vermitids. In comparison with the uh, Sicilian coast, they counted like 10,000 living individuals. So as like a, a small conclusion, we can say that vermitid reef are really correlated with human pressure. Also, very limited reef can be used as bioindicator. Uh, this photo uh, to show that also very limited reef in the cuvette, especially or the enclave of tidal pool, uh, we can find like some habitat former. In Lebanon, it's not like uh, weird to find like Simodose and Nodosa in this uh, tidal pool. So we found it and we take it, and this is something like uh, for us so strange. And as a management perspective, uh, it is important to increase scientific interest and awareness where vermitid risks are still neglected, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean part. And assess the distribution of, Mediterra of, ver of uh, Mediterranean vermitid risks, so that means uh, cartography, uh, modeling, in particular in the perspective of oil exploitation in some area of the Mediterranean Sea. And of course, better understand the dynamic of the vermitid reef in presence of impact, early, let's say, early warning signals or disturbance. So 
Conservation and monitoring of vermitid deep should be regularly done. That is so important. And with all this restoration action, again, the priority should always be preserving existing natural habitat before planning any restoration action. At the end, I want to thank the SPARAC for the support and the help and uh, to help us to make this study. And thank you all. Thank you, Ali, for your very interesting uh, and uh, uh, my presentation. And then uh, I ask the floor if there are some questions or consideration. I think it was so clear. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, but there are some some particular on the presentation, like you know, so the fish that is uh, Carassius aratus in, in the sea, or this sea turtle that is not sea turtle but is uh, from fresh water. Yes. Just to I think to attract the attention of uh, <laughs> the presentation, just to, to see if we are we are uh, pay attention to the presentation. Yeah. Okay. Thank thank you very much. And then we can close the, this part of the, the morning. And I leave the, the floor uh, to Hata for the logistics. OK, we, we will break for the lunch. Uh, don't eat so much because we have a, a gala dinner tonight. So you can find the indication where we will have the, the dinner the, at uh, 8 o'clock uh, tonight. So we resume at uh, 2 o'clock. We have. Uh, uh, two other uh, online uh, presentation, and then we start the, the next session. Also, we will have the uh, photo group uh, at the uh, um, coffee break of the afternoon, so uh, please be there uh, uh, on time. Thank you.